good night, everyone. Here it's um, seven. And we are taking quite a, a different direction today um, because last week we were mostly talking about scientific communication for COVID-19. And today um, we're going to talk about animal behavior with Dr. Carly York. And um, I'm very glad that she accepted to participate and to share her knowledge, as you can see on squids and uh, how they evade predators. And if you haven't seen her little flyer, she is an assistant professor of biology at um, the Noiran University. And it is during her PhD that she studied how squid use their sensory systems to evade predators. And um, I think she's enthusiastic about science and that's why she enjoys teaching and um, doing science communication. You can actually find her TED talk on YouTube. And uh, if she's not against it, I'll maybe share the link when I upload um, the video of the current talk. So thank you all for joining and our, yeah, thank you, Carly. Yeah, uh, thanks so much for having me. This is really exciting. Um, I love talking about squid whenever I can. Uh, so I was happy to jump at this opportunity. Um, before I get rolling into my talk, I did want to just do a really fast poll to see um, who you all are out in the audience so I can tailor this just a little bit. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch this poll. They're used to it now. Cool, give you all just a minute to answer this. Okay, cool. So we got a mixed group so far. So a few people still haven't voted. Give you all a few more seconds. Okay. All right. So it looks like we have a mixed group. I'm going to end this poll now um, and just close it out. So what I'll try to do is have a little something for everybody here. All right. So um, I studied squid for my doctorate and I was really interested in looking at how squid evade predators. Um, so my title here is Ink or Swim, How Squid Evade Predators. I'm going to give you some details on exactly how they do that. Oh, you know, we didn't test whether the slides progress. <laughs> oh, here we go. Hang on. <laughs> we tested everything, but we okay. <laughs> well, I'm here and not muted. I'm just reminding everyone that if you have questions, you can just post them in the chat while I, Carly is talking, and I'm just going to read all of them at the end. Okay, I'm muting myself now. All right, um, so squid belong to a group of animals called the cephalopods. And um, class cephalopoda includes squid, um, it includes cuttlefish, includes octopus, and it also includes the nautilus. Um, these animals have been around for quite some time. Um, their fossil record dates back to the Cambrian era. So that's looking at like 500 million years ago. So they've evolved some really cool adaptations in that time. So squid themselves are really fantastic predators, um, but they are also eaten by just about everything. So marine mammals will eat squid. Marine birds eat squid. Uh, other marine mammals, so both our sea lions and our seals, our cetaceans, our whales, um, humans too even enjoy eating squid. On top of that, of course, fish eat squid, sharks eat squid, other squid eat squid too. So they have predators coming at them from like every direction. Um, and given their really robust evolutionary history, it seems clear that their anti-predator behavior had to play a pretty big role in allowing them to survive and reproduce despite this enormous pressure. So for my PhD, um, I was really interested in looking at how squid evade predators. Um, 
but I wanted to look at how they did this throughout their entire lifespan. So depending on the, the uh, species of cephalopod you're looking at, this varies a little bit, but the type of squid I was looking at are like the calamari types of squid. And when they first hatch up as baby squid, um, we call them paralarvae. And the reason we call them paralarvae is because um, they have some really big differences from when they're adults, but they don't undergo a full metamorphosis like a butterfly does. Um, so it's enough of a difference to kind of give them this odd title of paralarvae um, instead of just calling them a hatchling, which some species do have a hatchling and those just look like miniature versions of the adults. Um, but some of the differences here between our baby squid and our adult squid, um, the first is their body shape. So a paralarval squid, they're going to be really tiny. So the species I looked at was 0.18 centimeters, which if you have a little bit of nail, um, it would probably fit on your nail. The babies also have these like short round little bodies. Um, and then they have a relatively larger funnel opening. So the way a squid swims is by pulling water into its body, pressurizing it and ejecting it out of a funnel. So in the babies, their funnel is pretty big. When the squid go through all the developments, um, their bodies become a lot more streamlined. The species I looked at was like five to eight centimeters. Dorsal mantle length is just the length of the body, not including the arms, because they can change those a lot. Um, and the adults also have a relatively smaller funnel opening. Um, because of these differences in size, they end up having some big ecological differences. So our paralarval squid are gonna be mostly planktonic, which means they can't swim against the ocean's currents. They're kind of just floating in the water. Um, they do undergo daily migrations up and down. So they'll move towards the light and back to the dark. But other than that, they're just at the mercy of how the ocean is moving. Adult squid, on the other hand, are really, really strong swimmers. Um, so they're called nectonic, meaning they can go wherever they want. They're not planktonic. Another big difference is um, the physical properties of how water behaves around the animal. Um, this term is called a Reynolds number. And it's the, the relationship between viscous and inertial forces on an animal. Um, and for a paralarval squid, they're going to be in really low Reynolds numbers. And what that means is that when a baby squid swims, it's kind of like it's swimming through honey. So it's going to be really hard for it to actually move. Like it takes a lot of energy for that little guy to move water. Um, so viscous forces are going to dominate when they're tiny. When they're full grown, they're moving into much higher Reynolds numbers. Um, that means iner inertial forces are going to dominate and they have this streamlined body that's going to help them to really like glide through the water and, and um, take advantage of that inertial force. So those are the big differences between our baby squid and our adult squid. So I had three major questions that I wanted to ask um, in my research here. First is what sensory systems do squid use to detect a predator? The second is how do squid behaviorally respond once they do detect a predator? And then how does their unique form of um, jet propulsion or locomotion help them to escape a predator? It's called jet propulsion. So let's start by diving into these sensory systems. So um, squid use multiple sensory modalities when navigating their environment, but vision is clearly a really important sense for them. Um, they have these ginormous, well-developed eyes. In our giant squid, they can be up to 16 inches um, in diameter. They're huge. And um, they're the only invertebrate that has a camera eye, just like our vertebrates. Um, they also have really well-developed optic lobes in their brain in order to integrate the sensory information. So vision is clearly a really important sense for them. 
we know and I wanted to take it into account in looking at how uh, vision actually helps them to evade a predator. But they also have this other sense that um, isn't taken into account quite as much. If you are familiar with fish, you might know of the structure called the lateral line. And the lateral line runs laterally alongside the body of the fish. And this lateral line consists of thousands of itty bitty little hair cells. And each of these hair cells is actually attached to a nerve. So um, when those hair cells get pushed around by the water, the animal can feel what's going on around it. Um, squid actually have a really similar system. So um, when this structure was discovered in the 80s, they weren't very creative with the name, so they called it the lateral line analog. Um, but you can see, looking at this little baby squid here, these are the lateral lines. So they're not actually lateral along the animal's body at all. They run along the head and the arms of the animal. Um, but structurally, it's very, very similar. So it's all these little tiny hair cells that allow the animal to sense where the water is moving around it. It's just a little clunky to talk about because it's not actually lateral. Um, so just remember that when you're thinking about this and how they're detecting the world around them. So we knew that squid had a lateral line analog. Um, that was about it. No research had been done on how they use this behaviorally. Um, but a ton of research has been done on how fish use their lateral line systems. Um, so a bunch of this research has been done on larva zebra, lar larval zebra fish. And um, what they found is that this lateral line system allows the uh, fish to detect the bow wave of an oncoming predator. So when this fish is swimming forward, it's pushing the water in front of it. And that push of water is gonna be picked up by the lateral line. The animal knows what direction it's coming and is able to escape. And what the research found is that if you ablated that lateral line system, so if you wiped out those hair cells, um, the baby fish could no longer detect the bow wave of the predator and their survivability dramatically decreased once that sensory structure was gone. So I wanted to do something really similar with the squid. See what happens to them with and without this lateral line system intact when they're faced with a predator. So to test this, I used two different species of squid. Um, again, I was interested in looking at the spectrum of life stages. So for the paralarvae, I used a species called Dorytuthus pilii. Um, and for them, what I ended up doing was ordering some egg sacs from a place um, up north and they sent them to me and I hatched them out in the lab. Um, they're really, really, really difficult to keep alive in captivity, both the babies and adults. So they'd hatch and I'd have about 48 hours to do all of my research before they would die. Um, so that was some panicky fun. Um, for the juveniles and adults, I was actually able to use a local species to where I was, go out on boats, and I'd use a trawling technique where we would throw a big net over the back of the boat, um, drive really slowly, catch whatever was going to be there, pull it up, grab the squid out, put them in a cooler, and drive them home. Um, it would have been ideal to be able to use the same species. I couldn't because um, Lollagunkula brevis, the species that I was able to collect, we have no idea where they lay their eggs. And we don't know where they go from like October until April. They disappear and we don't know yet. Um, and Dortuthus pilii, the ones I used for the paralarvae, they're actually not local to where I am. Um, and shipping a squid is impossible. So um, these two have really similar ecologies. They're actually kind of like the same squid, only Lollagunkula is south and Dorytuthus is north. 
and they're really similar body types. So it was the best I could do to look across these life stages. Now I said that this research had been done on fish um, in removing that lateral line system. And the way that they did this was by soaking them in an antibiotic solution, um, which is kind of a bizarre thing, but it ends up causing apoptosis of those hair cells. Um, so I had to actually go back and test the same technique on squid. Couldn't just assume that it would work on squid because it works on fish. Um, and I ended up having to use like double the strength of the antibiotic in order to get the same results. But on the left, you can see um, my control group there. So that's what a non-ablated squid looked like. And you can see that the hair cells are really abundant. Um, they look nice and healthy. And then in a 500 micromolar neomycin solution, um, most of the hair cells were gone. And what was left was really damaged. Um, so after I evaluated whether this would actually wipe out the lateral line, I had to observe them behaviorally for a while to make sure this didn't hurt them in any other way. Squid are super duper sensitive, um, and it's very easy to kill them. Uh, but luckily this didn't. Um, they swam normally, they continued to eat normally. Um, some several of them actually lived for a couple of weeks afterwards which is a long time to keep a squid in captivity so um for all intents and purposes this technique worked really well so my experiments looked a little something like this i had um like 500 gallon seawater tank and I used flounder as my predators for the adults, which um, you might look at a flounder and think they aren't impressive predators, but I gotta tell you, they were phenomenal. Um, every time I put a squid in there, one would be on it instantly. Um, in fact, one actually jumped out of the tank once and bit my hands because it got so used to me putting squid in there. Um, so these are serious predators, not to be messed with. Um, but I'd have a little basket in there, and I'd put the squid in, let them acclimate for 10 minutes, pull the basket up, and that's when I'd actually start my trials. So these were being recorded with uh, high-speed cameras. So we were looking to record escape attempts and survival, um, and recorded so we could get some details of those escape responses. And then I had basically the same setup but um, a miniature version for my paralarval squid. And for them, I ended up using little minnows as predators um, just because of the logistics of the experiments. Um, and it also reflected the ecology of the animal. Those are exactly the kinds of predators they would have at that stage. Now, since I was interested in looking at sensory systems, um, I had four different experimental groups here. So first was my control, where they were in a lighted condition and their lateral line systems were not ablated. Um, second one, they were in a lighted condition, but their lateral line system was wiped out. Third is we removed vision by adding blackout curtains to the uh, arena. Um, so no vision, but lateral line intact. And then the fourth was no vision and no lateral line system. All right, so our results were really quite interesting. Um, I'm just gonna move this little zoom bar real fast. And I hope I don't mess anything up. All right, nope, it's gonna stay. Uh, <laughs> all right, so we're looking at the mean proportion of escape responses of the squid. And then down at the bottom are the four treatment groups. So light non-ablated, light ablated, dark non-ablated, dark ablated. The gray bars are the juveniles and adults. The white bars are the paralarvae. So starting with our juveniles and adults here, you can see that there was a 100% escape response, regardless of treatment condition here. 
So didn't matter if it could see, didn't matter if it could feel, it still performed an escape jet. The parallelity though, we can see that there are some pretty big differences here, that when we removed that lateral line system here and here, we see a dramatic drop in the number of escape responses that we see. So what this told us is that the lateral line system clearly pay, plays an important role, um, especially in that paralarval stage of whether or not the squid is going to initiate an escape jet. So what we wanted to do next was sort of zoom in and look at that high speed video data to see what this escape response actually looked like. So starting with the paralarvae, um, these are four different measures that we looked at for how that escape response went. Uh, we've got mean velocity, and there was no significant differences in mean velocity across the four groups. Peak velocity, again, no significant difference across the four groups. Peak acceleration, no differences. Statistically, you can see there's a little drop, but it wasn't different statistically. Um, and then the time to reach peak velocity, also not statistically different. So um, we saw differences in whether or not the parallel RV were performing an escape jet. But when it comes down to how they actually jetted, there wasn't a difference. Um, and the reason that we think we saw this result is that squid have, have two parts of their nervous system that are responsible for escape jets. They have a giant axon, um, which allows for really fast stereotyped responses. And then they have a non-giant axon system, which allows for some like more variation within that jet. So the um, giant axon system is kind of an all or none response. And at this stage in development, it seems like the parallel RV don't have control over that non-giant system yet. So all they have is the stereotyped response. They're gonna jet or not jet. And when they jet, it's gonna look exactly the same. Now, for my juveniles and adults, um, I ended up with a bit of a research snafu. Um, and in the dark conditions, I didn't have enough lighting um, to actually um, be able to analyze my high-speed video, but I was able to do it in lighted conditions, and it turns out there's some really interesting information there. So again, we're looking at mean velocity, um, and in this, this time, the light group, non-ablated group, was significantly higher. Peak velocity, our non-ablated group, was significantly higher. Peak acceleration, again, significantly higher. Um, and then the time to actually reach peak velocity was lower in our non-ablated animals. So here we're seeing some more sophistication in this jetting system. Um, and that lateral line is clearly playing a role in how they're choosing to respond. So all of the squid performed an escape jet, but what that looked like was actually quite different depending on whether they had that lateral line system or whether they didn't. And those differences end up being reflected in survival. So just because they performed an escape response doesn't mean they survived. Um, so again, our juveniles and adults here are the gray bars and the paralarvae are the white bars. And we're looking at mean proportion of survival. Um, so starting with the juveniles and adults, you can see that there is a trend toward decreased survival as we remove sensory information. Um, so our light ablated group, they survived every interaction. But once we remove that lateral line system, it starts to drop. Once we put them in the dark, it starts to drop. And then once we put them in the dark and remove that lateral line system, it starts to significantly drop. Um, with the paralarvae, what we see is that um, survival is not significantly different in those first three groups. And that's likely due to the fact that regardless of how fast they went, the predator was gonna go faster. Um, but then we see an even bigger drop once we remove all of that sensory information. 
So what this tells us is that both of these senses are going to play a really big role in how squid are able to respond to these paralarvae. Um, vision's clearly playing a role here. Lateral line system too, as well, um, with both of those senses being removed in the paralarvae causing the biggest drop. So overall, I was able to say that this lateral line analog does aid vision to support successful predator evasion um, in squid at all life stages, which was really cool because before the study, we didn't actually have any evidence for how this was going to be used in an ecological system. Um, and this is a really, really cool example of convergent evolution. Um, our fish and squid are very, 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 very distantly related. So to see a similar type of a structure pop up in both animals is really, really neat. All right, so on to the second part here. We've looked at, you know, can they determine a predator is coming? So then what do they do behaviorally once they have detected a predator? So cephalopods are famous for being masters of camouflage. Up top, you see an octopus that is blending really, really well into some seaweed here. Um, and then down below is a cuttlefish. Here he's doing like a model pattern to blend in with the gravel. Um, and here he's trying really, really hard to even blend in with an artificial background of um, a checkerboard. So this is obviously an anti-predator strategy that they rely heavily on. And the way that they're able to accomplish these color changes is through an organ in their skin called chromatophores. Um, so each of these individuals is a chromatophore. And um, the way a chromatophore is structured is that it's like a sack of ink. And then around that is musculature. And each one of these is individually innervated. So they can control one at a time. And when they expand, Expand that, the color shows, and when they contract it, the color disappears. So they're able to create like an infinite, infinite number of patterns because each of these are individually innervated. All right, another trick that squid have up their sleeve is an inking response. Um, so ink is comprised of mucus which gives it a nice like viscous um, quality to it. Uh, melanin, which gives it its dark color. And then some interesting chemicals that we're not 100% sure um, how they're used, but L-dopa and dopamine, which are neurotransmitters for us. They're feel-good chemicals. They actually have this in their ink. Um, so they can use this ink in different kinds of ways. They can create like big smoke screens that they're then going to escape behind. They can create little decoys and put out ink in like the same size as their own body. Um, or they can just do these like quiet little poofs, poofs of, of ink. Um, so there's multiple different ways that they end up using their ink. And um, they also have some postures that they can use. So this is a arms splayed out position, trying to make them look a little bit bigger. They'll often toss their arms up over their head too, trying to just look a little bit scarier to an oncoming predator. Um, there are some cephalopods that have really extraordinary posturing abilities. The Indonesian mimic octopus is one of them who can actually become like all kinds of different animals. It's really amazing. Um, my species was a little more limited to these two behaviors. So I did the same kind of experimental setup for this part as well, where we still used our flounder, we still used the mummy chugs for the little guys. Um, we recorded these again with high-speed video. And what we found was rather surprising. Um, starting with the paralarvae, we saw that they only actually performed escape jets in 35% of attacks, which is low. Um, that's, that's not a particularly high rate of escape jetting. Um, there was only one inking event that we recorded. So this is definitely not something that they rely heavily on at this stage. Um, 
there was also no posturing that we saw them performing. So what were they doing? Things like this, where um, they were doing these really bizarre stereotyped behaviors, kind of nonstop. Um, so they would just go around and around and around, um, up and down, all kinds of different orientations. So we saw some zigzags, we saw spirals, we saw loops in that orientation and then in a vertical orientation. Um, and these are behaviors that you don't see the older squid doing at all. It's very, very specific to this life stage. Um, and we're thinking the reason that they do behaviors like this is because um, it actually makes them harder to catch. When they're being bizarre and difficult to predict their trajectory, it makes it a lot harder for a predator to catch them. Um, at this stage, at this body size, it's nearly impossible for them to outswim a predator. So their best bet is just kind of being too weird to actually catch them. So um, this graph is showing our juvenile and adult results. Um, so unlike our juveniles, or unlike our paralarvae, our juveniles and adults show some pretty um, thoughtful behavior when it comes to evading a predator. Um, so up top, we're looking at mean predator distance in body lengths. Um, so our juveniles, our adults, and then both put together. Um, so between posturing and performing an ink and escape jet, we saw that when a predator was far away, they were going to be more likely to perform posturing behavior. And they actually waited until a predator was much, much closer before performing an ink and escape jet. And this makes sense energetically because an ink and an escape jet is expensive. It takes a lot of energy in order to make ink. It takes a lot of energy to perform a high-speed escape jet. So at this stage in life, they're able to really assess where this predator is and how likely they are to actually be in danger. So they're going to wait until it's a more dire situation. At the bottom, we're looking at mean predator velocity. Um, so you see that when they're moving more slowly, they're just posturing. But once that predator picks up the speed, that's when they're going to ink and perform an escape jet. So they're waiting and they're thinking and they're saving their energy for when it's needed. And in terms of the body patterning, um, what we found is that up top you're looking at parallelity proportion of body patterns. We just lumped them in into these three categories of like a dark body where the chromatophores were fully expanded, intermediate, um, and then clear where they're fully contracted. And they spent significantly more time with a clear body pattern. And likely that's because on top of performing those really bizarre swimming behaviors, if they keep a clear body, they're pretty hard to see. Again, they're really tiny. And um, once they're translucent and swimming strangely, a predator is unlikely to be able to track them particularly well. Um, but in our juveniles and adults, they were most likely to perform a banded body pattern than any of the others. And there's two thoughts as to why they were doing this. Um, one is that it's a disruptive coloration. So it's going to break up the outline of the squid and perhaps a predator, again, won't be able to track it quite as well. Um, another school of thought is that this is an aggressive coloration and could be like a threatening um, kind of a body pattern to a predator. So overall, we saw these two different strategies behaviorally. Parallelity, you're gonna do those stereotype behaviors, gonna keep a clear body pattern, and they're just gonna hope to be able to survive until they're better developed, at what point they can actually start to assess the situation, they have more flexibility in their body patterns, um, and they're gonna save those really expensive responses for when it's most necessary. All right, on to this third question here about squid locomotion. Um, you know, the last line of defense, or yeah, the last line of defense is gonna be an escape. 
So once the behavior, once the predator has been detected, um, once the behaviors are no longer working and that predator is coming at them, they're going to have to perform an escape jet. So squid are really unique in how they swim. They use jet propulsion to swim. And the way that they do this is there's actually openings around their mantle. This is the mantle. And um, they'll pull the mantle open with the muscles surrounding it. And that allows water to actually flow inside the mantle. They're then gonna contract those muscles and pressurize that water and squirt it out of the funnel. And the funnel can actually move in 360 degrees so they can swim in any direction that they want to. They can swim arms first, they can swim tail first, they can swim sideways. Um, they have sort of all the options. And it used to be that people thought squid were actually really inefficient swimmers. Um, and when we talk about swimming efficiency, we're talking about moving water with the least amount of energy possible. Um, and because of this system that squid have, they're going to pull water in their body, they're going to pressurize it, and then they're going to jet. But then they're going to have to stop and refill their mantle, pressurize it, and jet again in order to swim. So it seems like it's a lot of work to move water for them, um, particularly a, in opposition to like a fish that's going to be just undulating its tail and constantly moving water back and forth. Um, but one thing that wasn't taken into consideration before is what the water is actually doing when it leaves the squid's body. And it turns out that flow features are really important for determining how efficient a swimmer is. Um, so we end up looking for vortex rings and this is showing a vortex ring down here. Um, basically, a vortex ring ends up in training water around it. So it's as though the animal has moved more water than they actually had. And that's going to work with Newton's laws of physics to propel that animal a little bit further. So we wanted to look at what was happening to the water as it left the squid's body. Now, in order to do this, I had to use some pretty fancy equipment here. Um, for the parallel V, I used what's called digital particle image velocimetry, and it's often called DPIV. And the way that this system works is you have water, and in this water, you have a bunch of glass reflective particles seeded throughout it. And then you have a laser. Um, and a camera that is going to be taking images at the exact same time that the laser is flashing. And by doing this, you illuminate the particles and you're able to actually capture how those particles are moving once they leave the animal's body. Um, so there's all kinds of fancy algorithms Then this goes into software that um, actually visualizes these jets for us. And we worked with an engineer to develop some MATLAB programming to then calculate out efficiency. Used a really similar type of um, equipment with the juveniles and adults. It just has to be at a bigger scale. Um, for them, we used defocusing digital particle tracking velocimetry. It's a lot of words. Um, this system actually collects data in three dimensions. The uh, one we used on the parallel only collects in two dimensions. Um, so this was the first squid research that's been done looking at the fluid in three dimensions. So it's a similar type of a setup. This was our fancy camera here collecting in 3D. Uh, we had a bigger water tunnel. Um, that red light you're seeing is the laser and you can't really see but it's seeded with those particles as well. Uh, we also collected high-speed video footage with this too. So here are what the parallel jets looked like. We ended up finding that they have two different types of jets that they can perform. Um, escape jet one was this like single pulse 
vortex ring. And we found that that has the efficiency of 95%, which is incredibly high. Um, Escape Jet 2 was a longer stream of water with a vortex ring off and down at the bottom. And this too was incredibly efficient at 94%. So this idea of them being inefficient is just completely inaccurate. Um, they're really, really efficient, particularly at this paralarval stage. And then the adults, you can see that the images we got from the two systems are a little bit different, but we saw those same two categories where escape jet one was a pulse and look at this beautiful vortex ring it produced. Um, and then Escape Jet 2 was this longer one, again, with a vortex ring down at the bottom. Um, in our adults, the efficiency was a little bit lower. So 89% for Escape Jet 1, 83% for Escape Jet 2. But overall, that's still really efficient. Um, these guys are working not particularly hard in order to move incredibly quickly. Um, the the velocities reflected in this study aren't really um, reflective of the animal's abilities at all. Like this is showing five body lengths per second and four body lengths per second. And the reason that they are so low is because of how small the tank was. Um, they would basically like bounce off the side of the tank before we were able to calculate an actual velocity. Um, in, in my other research, we were looking at our, they could go like, 50 body lengths per second, incredibly fast. Um, but we were at least able to capture the flow feature within that tank there. So overall in both groups, we saw these two different types of escape jets with the parallel RV being more efficient than the adults. And that likely goes back to some of the differences that we talked about at the beginning of the presentation, where the parallel RV have much larger funnel apertures and that allows them to actually move proportionately more water through their body and out their body. Um, and they can do this at a relatively low speed, which in order to maximize efficiency, you want to move water in and out actually at a pretty low speed. But the bigger takeaway message um, is that our squid are really, really efficient that by producing that vortex ring, out of their body, they're able to entrain more water around them, and that's going to push them even further than what they can physically hold within their body. All right, so there was a lot of people who were involved in this research. I had funding from NSF, Society of Integrative and Comparative Biology, um, and then as Marine Plug, the folks at TED-Ed made a little animated version of my dissertation, so I'd encourage you to check that out. That was really, really fun to work with them. Um, and I'd be more than happy to answer questions that you have now. Thank you, Carly. It was like, really fantastic. I don't know how the other speakers feel because I know there are a few in the audience, but I personally feel very stressed now because like, <laughs> I'm going to show protein spectra and I think everyone is just going to log out after this. It's, it was really, really great. Um, so I don't know if questions are going to pop up. Uh, usually they arrive quite late, but I have a few. Um, okay. So, you know, I, I thought that our arms of the squid were really involved in swimming, but now I see that it's, uh, it's mostly the mental. So, at the end, what are the arms for? <laughs> what do you do with it? <laughs> I'm just confused. They're, <laughs> they're mostly for holding prey. Um, the way that they capture prey, so squid have eight arms and then two tentacles. And the tentacles are able to be like contracted in their body. And then when they go to catch something, they kind of like shoot them out and grab it. And then they'll wrap their arms around that prey item and hold it there while they eat it. Um, yeah, squid have beaks and no teeth. So it's like, imagine an alien with a parrot beat beak, like holding you in its arms. Yeah, that feels horrible. But <laughs> it's, it's a slow death. I'm sure you remember, there was a comment earlier. So Philip was saying that uh, when the baby squids are, are moving all over the place, maybe it uh, helped them appear bigger. 
Um, yeah, might be. Uh, sure. I have also a comment for, from Jordan Freya from Cambridge, and he's saying like, how conserved is the ability to use ink among squids? That's the first one. Um, as most cephalopods, I can't think of any species that doesn't use ink, um, if that's what you mean. Um, it's going to be used a little differently in like some of our deep sea squid, um, maybe as more of a social communication tool, but the research hasn't been like empirically, that hasn't been empirically tested. It's more just some um, hypotheses about how they're using ink. Um, but yeah, I don't know of any species that doesn't have it. He confirmed that that was his question. And he has a second one. Uh, what is the predator response to ink clouds? It depends. Um, I actually saw times where my squid would produce that pseudomorph where it was like the same shape and size as their body. And it would sometimes fool the flounder. They would go and they would chomp on that instead of the squid. So I saw that work as a decoy. Um, there's some thought too that the L-dopamine and um, or the L-dopa and dopamine maybe give the predators a little dose of some happy chemicals and make them less likely to keep attacking the prey. That too has not been tested. Um, just, just some thoughts amongst the community about why they have those chemicals in there. That's great. Um, so I have a question from uh, Arnaud Blanta saying, I'm amazed at the complexity of this thesis. Is it standard for zoology thesis to involve a lot of experiments in fancy machines like that? It is. Um, that kind of, a, the um, one I used on Paralarvae, the DPIV, that one is, I want to say, like, rather common. Uh, I mean, and by that, I mean, there's probably 100 people plus that use it. Um, the 3D system that I used on the older squid, there's only two people in America that have that system. Um, one was my PhD advisor, and then the other is a lab in, at Harvard. Um, so we actually, I, the, my university is called Old Dominion University, and it's not Ivy League, it's not one of the most prestigious universities, um, but my advisor, was prolific at what he did and was able to get this system. So we had people from the best universities in the country coming to us to use this 3D system, which was really cool. So I was incredibly lucky to be like one of the first people to be able to actually test this thing out. Yeah, that sounds great. I know I had a second question. So, so I was saying, did you know it would take that many experiments to, to do? Um, yeah, I did. And I got lucky. Um, I got lucky because my experiments mostly worked. And often that's not the case, especially when you're looking at animal behavior. There's, so there's two things that go wrong all the time. Um, your animals die, your animals don't cooperate. And, I'm, and then the third is your technology fails. So if you can get all three of those things to not happen on a single day, then that's a huge win. Um, so what I used to do is, they. so I, I mentioned they're really hard to keep in captivity. They're like really, really hard to keep. They don't have any concept of walls. So they just bounce off walls until they have abrasions all over themselves and then they die. Um, they'll also jump out of tanks. Again, no concept of walls. So I would, go out on the boat. It was like an hour and a half drive, be out on the boat for a few hours, get as many squid as I could, um, put them in a cooler, drive them home, put them into the tanks. I'd like go get a quick bite to eat, get all my cameras calibrated. And then I'd spend that night running my experiments because I knew if I waited, my animals would die. So <laughs> it was it was a real effort to make sure I, I could get this data collected. Um, so, but I got lucky. I, I really feel like I got lucky that things worked. Yeah, it really highlights how much 
animal research is challenging. Like there are so many things that can go wrong. And sometimes you end up with a paper that might seem minor for everyone. And you just think about how much work you had to put in this. And it's just insane. Like everything can go wrong with it. Yes. Yes. that you didn't expect it's always kind of weird surprise and you just you just want to cry <laughs> yeah so before i read the other question i uh, from philip i just had one that was a bit more related to that so how do you grow them so when you get them back from the ocean do you like keep the same local water and do you breed them in that or do you have some um some water that you had for which you control the condition like ph and everything yeah, I actually had to mix up my own water, which was a job in and of itself. Um, we would get like a thousand pounds of salt delivered. Um, and I'd have to mix up my own water every time. And they, um, the way that they excrete their waste is through ammonia, which is really toxic. So the tanks require really complicated filtration systems, but still, if you're not changing the water, like every two days, it becomes too toxic for them. So I was constantly mixing up salt water and pumping it into the tanks and pumping water out. It's a, yeah, it was a job. Hey, sounds super fun. <laughs> <laughs> a question from Philip saying, what is the mechanism that allows the squid to see one side pattern uh, in order to reproduce it to on the other side? Say that one more time let's see uh, i guess he's asking how the squid is just saying a pattern pattern and just reproducing it on his body is that it philip is oh it? let's see you produce it on the other side oh are you, i yes that's what he meant okay so basically like how do they match how do they see and match their body um this has been actually, it's a more complicated question than it seems. So squid and cuttlefish and octopus are actually colorblind. Um, they only have one photoreceptor pigment with the exception of the firefly squid. So it's been kind of a big mystery in terms of how they're able to match their background so well when they can't see color. And um, Turns out that like brightness plays a huge role and they're able to see polarized light, which is um, light that's been refracted off of something, reflected and then refracted. Um, and so brightness plays a big role in that. It also seems that they, um, when light passes through their lens at different points, it can perhaps, um, be refracted in ways that give them color vision that the photo pigments don't reflect. Um, so it's complicated and we don't 100% really know. So it's complicated and then you put it on a checkerboard. It feels a bit evil though. Yeah, yeah. but it, they do it no problem. And I think even like that's probably an easy question for them because of the difference in brightness. Mm. Um, it's like, hmm, do this. Um, they're amazing. We still just, we don't understand very much. Is it, uh, is it clear now how antibiotics um, affect the hair cells? It seems like a weird thing. It's so weird. And the reason we know that that technique works is because it was used in hearing research. So the lateral line system is pretty similar to like the hair cells that are in our ears. And often when people lose um, hearing, it's because of damage to those hair cells. So um, yeah, I don't know why, it just totally damages them. And um, it, it kind of like causes that hair cell to just disintegrate. But in terms of why, I don't know. Because <laughs> yeah. that's still an observation for now. We don't know the why of everything yet. Yeah. Um, another question from uh, from Jordan is asking, do we know if it's a conscious uh, color change? Um, I, I think it is a conscious color change. Um, so the way that the chromatophores work is that they get the cue through their eyes and it goes to their brain, to their optic lobes. And then they actually have a lobe in their brain called the chromatophore lobe. 
So that's just responsible for controlling the musculature there around each chromatophore. Um, so I, I would argue it's a conscious change. I actually, when I was defending my dissertation, one of my committee members took me to task on this where he thought they were more like little, little robots that weren't consciously thinking. And I, I think they are. Um, and I think that my data that looks at them assessing a predator situation supports the idea that they're consciously controlling what they're doing. Um, so I vote, yeah, some people will vote no, but there's also a lot of people who will say that uh, organisms don't have conscious control over things because they're invertebrates. Um, there's, there's lots of conversations about like animal intelligence and people who want to think of them as lesser beings and they don't buy into that. But you know, in France, when you are, you're doing animal research, um, so you need ethical approval uh, for vertebrates, but there is actually um, an amendment just for squids. So yes. I don't think it's the same uh, in the US, but for us it just yeah. is the only for which you need ethical approval. Yeah, not yet, but there should be for sure. Mm. Thank you, Kali. Uh, that was the last question. It's been really, really so fun. I have been receiving texts like her, like her slides are great. She's great. So like, I think everyone loved it. <laughs> and, uh, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, I learned a lot of things and I really found it amazing. So it was really a pleasure. And uh, yeah, so I have shared your Twitter handle. So just go follow Kali on Twitter. And I also share the link of her TED talk. And, uh, and then you all set. I'll also share her recording uh, next week so you can uh, go back to uh, this video if you missed the beginning of it. Thank you so much, Carly. It's been so uh, fun. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I guess I see you're wrong. <laughs> Bye. Yeah, thanks. Thanks everyone for coming.